Hey there, Commanders. I just thought I would uh, make a video for some of the new players who are going to be joining the game and explain some of the different dynamics of weapon selection. I'm going to assume initially that you're not going to have any engineering blueprints unlocked and go over some of the different weapon selections that you can consider when before you add engineering. That way, when you do unlock engineers, you can upgrade some of these stable builds incrementally over time and, and start experimenting more freely with other weapons and different types of hard points. But <coughs> I wanted to start by explaining a few of the tools that a lot of more experienced players in the game rely on in order to do accurate builds. Um, this is called Coriolis.io. It's a free service. It's a third-party website that was set up by some fans of the game and it contains a comprehensive database of all of the ships that can possibly be used including some that are not available to the general player base unfortunately and then it has the ability to save different builds that you construct using different ships so that you can refer back to them later um, we'll, we'll get into that in a minute and if you get really into it you can compare different builds that you put together in order to see what advantages or disadvantages they might present in a given situation if you're new to the game, I want to start by introducing you to just about every Elite Dangerous Commander's bread and butter. The two weapon hardpoints that just absolutely go together on almost any ship and can be run with almost any capacitor so long as you understand basic pip management and basic power setups, which I'm also going to go over, but I want to do this incrementally. First, it doesn't really matter what role that you prefer in Elite Dangerous. Nobody's going to criticize you for having a couple of hard points on your ship to at least deal with NPC interdictions. And if you're new to the game and don't quite understand its mechanics yet, or want to learn in an environment that's more forgiving, the two hard points that I recommend universally for people learning the game are gimbaled pulse lasers of any size, they're available in every size, and gimbaled multi cannons, which are available across basically the same ranges as the pulse laser. The reasons why I recommend these two is because uh, most builds in this game are going to attempt to have weapons to address the shields in the hull, as the training scenarios will attempt to teach you if you do take them. Um, energy weapons, as a general rule, have infinite ammo, but a high energy draw. And you can see here, uh, let's see, DPE, damage per megajoule of energy and energy per shot. These are stats the game's not going to give you in its interface. You actually have to go to Coriolis and look these up. Um, energy per second, damage per megajoule of energy, and heat per second on energy weapons are always going to be higher. Engineering will fiddle with that a little bit, but we'll worry about that later. Pulse lasers, when two, engine, when two, engineer, when two unengineered ships get into a fight, the energy weapons are going to have an advantage against shields, and the kinetic weapons are going to have an advantage against hull. And you can see here the um, the damage per shot, or sorry, the energy per shot is 1.7 on a multi cannon, and the energy per shot is 3 on a pulse laser. So the multi cannon draws a little more than half of what the pulse laser will draw in a given situation. And the pulse laser is the most efficient of the energy weapons. I recommend that people start with these weapons when they're learning because they allow you more freedom of pip flexibility when you're setting builds up. So I'll give you a good example. Um, this down here is my basic vulture. This basic vulture assumes no engineering whatsoever, so you don't see any gear icons, and is actually one of my favorite ships to fly. If I'm not flying any, if I, if I can't use engineering, if I'm doing curated PvP where engineering isn't allowed, this is a really good go-to. Now in this case I have a fixed pulse laser because fixed weapons will always do the most damage per unit of any archetype in the game. They are, if you're good with your controls and you understand how to place your ship and you have a little bit of practice with FA off and know how to switch between them efficiently, then fixed weapons are going to be your boy. They're going to allow you to push your damage output to the absolute limit. They will make you immune to a lot of the countermeasures that other players can use, like chaff launchers. But they do put a lot of emphasis on your capacity to really control and understand your ship, because fixed weapons are also going to draw more power for that damage per second. This is one of the dynamics you have to understand in Elite Dangerous. Of all of the weapon archetypes, fixed weapons will draw the most power 
and require the most resources of all of the weapon types in the game. Gimbals are going to come in just underneath them, and turrets are going to have the lowest power draw requirements, but they're also going to do the lowest damage. And I'll actually illustrate this by switching. Uh, putting, I'll put up the fixed multi cannon here. Do -do -do. And you'll see um, the DPS, and this is the big number that you should be paying attention to whenever you're putting a ship together, because DPS matters. But being able to place that DPS matters more. For that reason, I, even though I've got close to 3,000 hours in this game, still like to throw a couple of gimbaled weapons on my ship, especially when those weapons are kinetics, because you don't get the almighty point-and-click power of a laser when you're using kinetics. And so gimbals give you the ability to more flexibly target ships, but they also make you vulnerable to the enemy chaffing. But you'll see here, 18 versus 23. So this uh, fixed variant of the weapon is going to do you five more damage per second, but in my experience, fixed multi-cannons are one of the more unwieldy and less forgiving weapons in the game. There are more unforgiving weapons in the game than a fixed multi-cannon, but uh, I'll give you a good example of where this can really come and bite you. If you use fixed multi-cannons and fixed laser weapons, you're going to have a weapon that requires lead time, because you'll see down here the shot speed, 1600 meters per second is going to force you to point the nose of your ship ahead of where your targets at you have to fire it where they're going to be when you use kinetics not where they are and all of the lasers are instant point-to-point -point connections they use hit scan if you're into video game design and understand what that means so when you're targeting an enemy ship with laser weapons you're gonna have the freedom and flexibility to point your ship directly at the thing you want to kill and it's a lot easier to track targets with, uh, with a laser that is fixed than it is with a kinetic weapon of any class that is fixed. And you'll never be able to get both of these weapons on target at the same time if they're both fixed. So if you want to play with fixed weapons and you're new, I recommend that you start playing with fixed weapons on lasers only because even pro players, if they do try to put everything fixed on their ship, they're going to have some consideration for separating those weapons out so they're not firing at the same time because again even if you're at a kilometer distance when two ships are flying at high speed one of these two weapons is destined to miss and generally speaking most players when they're running uh, lasers and multi cannons on a ship will opt to put gimbals on for the multi cannons and leave their laser weapons fixed now I'm a little bit lazy and I like to use gimbals on both because it does lower the amount of power you have to shunt to your weapons and that gives you a little bit more freedom to do some other things in combat that you'll want to be aware of, and I'll get to that in a minute. But the, the synergy that pulse lasers and multi-cannons have is really, really good. And as you start to get more familiar with how these weapons work and with how your ship works, you're going to be able to start playing with this dynamic. You can, for example, go from a pulse laser to something like, and I'm going to put it down here in the multi-cannon slot for contrast, <coughs> something like a burst laser. Now you'll notice here the pulse laser does 14 damage per second gimbaled, the burst laser does 16 damage per second gimbaled. So you do get a damage output increase, but you also get a requisite increase in the amount of energy that you have to commit to the weapon. Burst lasers are the number two boy in these scenarios. So if you've got a whole bunch of weapons capacitor in combat and you don't end up having situations where you have to take a break and charge it or dump a whole bunch of pips into the weapons capacitor to keep your hard points turning out, then you can consider upgrading from a pulse laser to a burst laser. And if you really have your power management nailed down, then you can switch from a burst laser to a beam laser. Now this is the highest demand weapon in the entire game. If you're putting beam lasers on your ship for energy, uh, as your energy weapon, then, then you've got to really know what you're doing because the beam laser is the highest damage output. It's up here at 20.3 compared to the burst laser 16.6, just so you can see the comparison to a pulse laser. Um, you're getting just under six more DPS, and that can add up in a fight. Um, beam lasers put out the most damage, but they also put out the most heat. They do offer you the most opportunity to inflict damage on target because they perpetually fire and are inflicting constant damage. And that, the advantages of that when you're only getting a couple of seconds to fire on a target or a snap, uh, snap glancing blow across your target's cross-section, a, a beam laser can get you more, but it's going to cost you more. You'll also note, too, uh, that the beam laser and the pulse laser 
have different piercing values. There's a, a two-point piercing difference between a beam and a pulse. That starts to mean something when you engage bigger targets, but the two-point difference here isn't significant enough that I'm particularly too concerned about it. But the other thing to note about laser weapons that people often forget is that they have damage fall-off that starts to kick in really fast. The pulse laser's fall-off is shorter than the beam lasers, but you're still only talking about a half a kilometer, and that damage fall off really starts to kick your ass in combat engagements over two kilometers. You're not putting out anywhere near the damage that you're putting out. And in the Vulture's case, if you're fighting against something like a Ferdy Lance, which is considered the apex medium ship in the game, his armor is going to be higher than your piercing value, and so you're going to be taking hits to your maximum damage output as you try to, to attack that target. Your weapons are going to underperform as compared to attacking something softer like a Colbro or a Viper. Now, <clears throat> when putting your build together, you have to be aware of how the other subsystems in your ship are going to interact with your weapons, because they're all sharing the same resource pool. They all have to draw off of a power plant that has power limitations, and they all have to draw from a power distributor that can only put so much out in a given moment. And then you also have to be concerned with your ship's heat capacity, which is another mechanic in the game that you don't necessarily have to worry about too much when you're using uh, pulse lasers and multi-cannons because these weapons are efficient and don't tend to dump more heat into your ship than it can handle. Most vessels that I've flown can deal with with pulse lasers and multi-cannons firing all at once. So, <clears throat> but, but just for the record, every ship in the game has a maximum heat capacity. I'll actually look that up for you so you can see it. This is something that, that the game's documentation doesn't really communicate to you, but I'll actually go to the forums right here. Heat capacity is the amount of heat that your ship can actually dump. Um, take note of the URL up here, um, or just Google search it like I did, and you can find this on the forums. But the player base has done a lot of work going over the capacity that each ship has. And not all of it's been verified, but I consider the information here to be pretty credible and even if it hasn't been verified this number is going to be pretty close to functional reality so keep it in mind when you're looking at ships and and doing your selections but don't worry about it too much unless you're at a high enough level that you want to min max but as a general rule a higher heat capacity compare the FDL to where is the vulture in here there it is the FDL to the vulture The capacity is the amount of heat that a ship can absorb before it starts to really build up. And this, if you want to go in here and read this, it, it goes over everything in detail. But as a general rule, the higher the number, here the Type 10 is basically the king of heat capacity, the more, let's see, heat per shot is in here. Where did it go? EPS, range, ROF, heat per second. The higher this number is for... Uh, BTU capacity, the more weapons putting out an HPS with big numbers you can actually stick on a ship. So that the Type 10, for example, is is considered universally to be one of the crappier ships in the game for PvP, but it's a powerhouse with the highest theoretical DPS of any other ship in the game. It also has the thickest armor, and because it's so big, it also has the ability to mount some of the most heat-intensive weapons that you can possibly stick on a ship. Uh, and there, there are places where the Type 10 can be relevant. We'll get to the Type 10 later. But I want to express that um, this number is what makes some ships overheat really easy compared to others. So and you take a look at the Hauler is a small ship. It has a 185 BTU. And the Eagle, which is also a small ship, has a 249. The Hauler only has one hard point. So you're not going to overheat it in most situations, but you are going to run into some situations where the Eagle can overheat if you're trying to maneuver and fire at the same time. You'll, uh, your multi-cannons and lasers all together can actually push it into some, some dangerous territory. And also, as a side note, um, if you go and look at things like the Imperial ships, here's the Clipper, and where is the Courier? It's hiding. Do, 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 do. There you are. The Courier has a really low heat capacity for ships in its class. and you'll, no, This is a problem across all of the Imperial ships, is that the power plant combination 
and available heat capacity usually cause Imperial ships to run pretty hot. So you should keep that in mind if you're doing couriers or cutters or clippers because these ships don't like being around stars and they definitely don't like pure energy builds without some consideration for power, uh, for, he for heat extraction. Um, and that, uh, that, that's some more advanced stuff I can get into later. So the Vulture that I have in this basic configuration uses a biweave shield generator. It assumes you're, you're mostly doing PvE. If you're doing PvP, you'll probably want to put a main shield generator in here and uh, shield cell banks and some other little odds and ends. I can talk about PvP in a separate video. But biweaves give you a lot of system capacitor draw. And that's something that you have to be uh, worried about is generally if you use biweave shields on any ship build, you're going to want to make sure that you've either got an absolutely kick-ass power distributor or that your hard points aren't pulling too much power. Because if you pair biweaves with pure energy builds, you're going to be struggling to keep your, your capacitor banks filled on both ends. And that's one important thing about biweaves to keep in mind is that if you're using these things, you want to make sure that that system's capacitor is is fully charged as often as you can have it. Because if it ever runs out and a biweave will kill your system's capacitor really fast, then you lose the ability to use any of your utility mounts until your system's capacitor builds up enough power for these things to work. So if this goes out, you can't do kill warrant scans, you can't pop heat sinks, and you can't use chaff. And chaff is going to save your your butt more times than not. When especially in PVE, if you get multiple uh, wing members firing on you, this is how you buy yourself some time to kill a target, to disable a specific hard point, or to take care of, of whatever it is that you need to take care of. And that's why on this build, I'm assuming new players are flying it. You want to have two because then you can double chaff. And if you get your timing just right, you can overlap these such that that you're basically always protected from gimbaled weapons. But not all NPCs are going to run gimbals. You're going to run into especially elite ranked NPCs that'll have fixed weapons and fighters and other things where these chaff launchers aren't always going to work. But early game, these are your best buds and they're going to keep you alive in most Hazrez encounters that you're going to run into. They'll let you take on a lot bigger targets than you and survive. Um, as you progress in the game and become more familiar with the different mechanics that are available, these become less important and you can start getting away with fewer of them. But early game, especially when you're learning, have at least one of these on board, but preferably two if you can spare it. And as you learn how to build um, armor and how to configure shields, then you'll start to lean on these less and you'll end up replacing a chaff launcher with shield boosters or, or different other items of note. <coughs> so, pip management in Elite Dangerous is why I love Coriolis. You have the ability when running pip, uh, when in Coriolis to simulate the type of energy load that your ship's going to be under. Uh, this also lets you see how much power that your power plant is going to produce. And that's this module up here. If you're unfamiliar with how power plants work, um, as a general rule, you want A-rated power plants as often as you can fit. There are a few exceptions to this rule. Uh, we're not going to worry about those right now. And the reason why you want to take A-rated when it's available for combat ships is the efficiency, which basically is the indicator for how much heat the power plant's going to produce per unit of energy that is drawn off of the power plant. In case you weren't aware, um, the higher you fill this bar, the more your the higher your ship's resting heat is going to be, and that's actually indicated on Coriolis. Where did it go here? Do, 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 do. Resting heat. This is a calculation. It's not always gospel, but it gives you a good idea where you're going to sit. A resting heat of 36.28 means that you're reasonably detectable, and that most other ships in the instance, especially ones controlled by players, are going to be aware of you. The um, Resting heat also represents your maneuvering capacity before you start testing your limits. Because on a, especially on a vulture, vultures, vultures need a little bit of massaging from the engineering system to really wake them up. But this build is, is, is going to be solid. You don't have to worry about that too much. But one of the things to consider when, when setting up combat ships is where your resting heat is going to be. Because the lower you can get that number, the more ridiculous and aggressive that you can fly before you start testing the limits. Because your thrusters, uh, every time that you use your thrusters, that you bank, pitch, roll, whatever it is that you're doing, especially when you hit the boost button, these guys are going to dump a whole bunch of heat into your ship's systems. 
in addition to the heat that your weapons are dumping in. And usually when you run into overheat issues in combat, it's going to be because you are boosting to twirl around a target or kite somebody while firing your weapons. That puts a lot of load on your ship systems. The lower you can get this number, the more often you can do that without overheating. But don't panic if you overheat. A nominal 110% overheat isn't going to cook your systems too bad. 99% of the ships in this game can deal with that. It's okay. What you want to not do is consistently overheat for long periods of time or have a bunch of little overheats daisy chained up in a row because as you continue to fight and as you start taking combat damage, that's all going to start adding up and it's, it's going to ruin your day. So, um, I'll, and I'll give you an example of this by switching to a 4C power plant. And you'll know the resting heat goes up a full percent because a 4C power plant only has a 0.5 efficiency, where a 4A power plant has a 0.4. Now, I can't, it, it won't let me, well, it will let me equip a derated power plant just for the purposes of demonstration. <coughs> and you'll see here that the Coriolis is lit up, indicating that your ship can't support this build. It lets you do this because you can power manage your way into supporting this power plant if you really want to, and you do that by disabling specific modules. And if you go in and disable enough, you'll see that the uh, power plant indicator is, is back up to letting you know that this can work. But generally speaking, disabling your life support and your AFM are not, a, are not good recipes for success um, in combat. Although I do know some commanders who will power manage the AFM and then repair between engagements. So you can get away with that one. But A-rated power plants, when putting together combat builds, you want the biggest A-rated power plant you can stick in there. And you, as you start to experiment with engineering, there's different offerings you can go. There's also Guardian power plants, but these babies, they produce a ridiculous amount of power, but their efficiency is up there with the 4C. If I scroll down here, you'll see that gives you an extra... Mm, takes you from, I think it was at... Yeah, we were at 105% on the... Wait a minute. 105% on the 4A. Where did I mess that? No, I didn't mess that up. I had something down here disabled. Oh, yeah. Um, you can, in combat, you can power manage your frame shift drive and your cargo hatch to bring your power draw back under control. And that's generally what people will, will do. That's the first two things they'll lose. Uh, if you're going to do PvP or you're expecting to be ambushed, you can leave your frame shift drive on and disable your AFM to buy you a whole bunch of extra breathing room. Now, another consideration I mentioned before, uh, power plants will produce more heat the more you draw on them. Their efficiency has an impact on what their maximum resting heat is, but you'll not resting heat up here, beta. If I go down here and I start turning stuff off, this is just for the purposes of demonstration, I get that value low enough, down below 40%. Oh, dang it. Resting heat doesn't include that in its calculations. Okay, well... Um, if you can get your power draw down under 40%, then you start getting some really good heat gains. And that's something that you can try to gun for. But I'll leave this AFM off. I recommend new players have an AFM on a Vulture because it's got a giant cockpit canopy and it's liable to get shot out if you let your shields drop. And if you're learning, there's probably going to be an occasion where that happens. AFMs let you repair your cockpit canopy in combat and it can help improve your survivability because if the if the cockpit canopy ever blows out you there's nothing you can do you have to return to a station and if you have a depending on your life support it gives you different amounts of time to do that i recommend a rated life support on all combat builds especially for new players because it gives you 25 minutes plenty of time to take a deep breath figure out what you're going to do to get yourself back to the nearest station. If you happen to be rolling with a commander who has a fleet carrier, you probably don't have to fly that far. But if you ever lose your cockpit canopy in combat, you're going to lose a huge chunk of your user interface. So, um, in Elite Dangerous lore, your cockpit canopy actually projects your UI. And when this, uh, when your cockpit canopy goes, you're going to get a big F-off hole in the middle of that glass screen in front of you. And any UI element that sits inside of that hole that's being projected onto the glass, you're going to lose. So you're not going to be able to see where you're going. And if you're trying to navigate to a station, you're not going to have that marker up on the cockpit canopy glass to help guide you in. So you're going to have to rely on your compass. If you don't know what a compass is, I would recommend that you go back and watch the training videos because they go over all of that and their, their description is pretty accurate. But <coughs> 
The final thing when, when putting a build together, as I mentioned before, pip management. This tool in Coriolis is probably one of the most valuable that, that you can use. It lets you go over, um, this goes over all of your power and all of your costs, including a calculated rebuy down in this corner of the screen. You can account for discounts if you happen to be in a system that offers them, like a Leon Rui system. You can go in and say, okay, I got my ship for a 15% discount, and if you're really feeling confident in your ability to navigate, then you can go around to different Leon Rui systems and get module discounts, and that knocks a, a pretty good sum off of the price of your ship. If you have the opportunity to buy discounted modules, especially some of your more expensive ones, like armor, thrusters, the frame shift drive, those are, are things that you should consider doing, the, the, especially when you get into building bigger and bigger ships. This this number can get huge. I think the most expensive ship in the game you can build right now is a cutter. It can cost 1.3 billion if you outfit it just the wrong way. And that gives you a rebuy just north of 40 million credits. So anywhere that you can shave that off is a good thing. But for our purposes, and so that you can get an, hang on, an accurate reflection of how much money you're going to spend building one of these bad boys, when you get there, it's a 30 million credit ship. This is a, uh, something that, to, that you could aspire to over time. I can go in and I can uh, do some demos of different smaller ships that you can build, but the Vulture's, the Vulture is, I think, the final word on small ship combat. Once you get to this ship, uh, a lot of the other small ships have their niches where they can, that they can kill you, so don't, don't think that you're going to be the, the king of the playground in one of these things, but if you get into one of these ships as a player, you're you're going to be able to outclass any of the NPC ships pretty much in your category with relative ease. And the Vulture, as a small ship, is actually more than capable of killing medium and large ships in open combat. And especially as you get into engineering, you're, you're going to see ways to absolutely bring that to life. That's going to be you're going to have a lot of fun. Believe me, it, it, this is one of it's hard to get here. It takes a bit of time to get 30 million credits. You're probably going to be into the game in five, six, seven hours. It's not too tall of an order, especially if you can find another commander who wants to boost you up. And for that, I would recommend uh, Elite Dangerous Community Discord or Kaizen's Discord. There's People will literally line up to help you put this stuff together. And this is just my take on it. There are going to be people out here who have a problem with my take on it. They're going to think that I'm wrong and that I don't know what I'm talking about. And da -da 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 -da. This, this is just advice. So take this however you want to take it, but uh, recognize that you, you're going to have to be patient because this game, this game is probably one of the hardest games to learn how to play well. Uh, to give you a little perspective on what I've put into this, I have a $500 all-metal HOTAS sitting on my desk that I use to control my ship. Keyboard and mouse players are going to have a slightly different experience than me, but the core logic behind ship builds remains pretty much the same. And um, I would pay attention to your stat bars up here because these, these tell you how much endurance you actually have in combat. Um, I think that's, that's a good introductory. I'll probably make another video here in uh, maybe a couple of days or maybe next week where I go over some of the deeper nuances of setting up different ships because um, there's different ways that you can set up shields to, to proc for different advantages and different types of combat. Armor does make a difference. I, I th shield tanks are your preferable option in most situations, but there are some places where you want to have a lot of armor. If you do decide you want to fight Thargoids, this figure ends up mattering a lot because it, it determines your ability to resist caustic damage, which is its own thing we can get into later. Um, but I, I want I, I don't really want to get too deep into shield construction mechanics or armor construction mechanics because uh, these are pretty deep and the way that you set these up is going to have a, a significant impact on how you play the game. So I will table this for now um, and talk to you all later.